Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. It's not often I get this excited about a new theory, but the one I'm discussing in today's video is absolutely fantastic. In my opinion, it's a real game changer, and it concerns the enigmatic site of Stonehenge. As we know, Stonehenge is one of the world's most famous ancient monuments, and people have used the stones to measure certain astronomical alignments to see if the arrangement of the stones has a connection to the sun, moon and stars, and on the summer and winter solstice, many people flock from all over, standing amongst the giant sarsen stones and imagine what it was like for ancient Britons more than 4,000 years ago. But most people take it for granted that this was always a stone monument, that this was always the way it looked. There is an assumption the stones were symbolic and ritualistic, and people rarely consider the idea that what we are actually looking at is the stone framework or skeleton of a large enclosed structure, a structure that also had a roof. Although various renovation projects have taken place over the years, much of the monument has lasted through various turbulent eras of British history, including the Roman conquest, the Norman invasion and of course the Viking raids. It's amazing it's still here today, and being a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it should remain for many centuries to come. New theories about Britain's ancient Neolithic structures always grab my attention probably because I myself am British, but also because these structures are still a mystery. That's why I was excited to hear about the work of landscape architect Sarah Eubank, who believes that Stonehenge was once a spectacular thatched building, and all we can see today is the ruined framework. In my research I sometimes gloss over new theories, because many of them seem too unbelievable or lack evidence. Some of them are just too out there but I too have long thought the same as Sarah, that the stones could actually be the framework of a more functional and more complex structure. Sarah considers it a kind of Neolithic version of the Royal Albert Hall, and she has even made a detailed model of how she thinks it once looked. It is built on a scale of 1 to 33, and when I heard about it initially, I have to admit I didn't have high hopes, but her model and explanation is certainly persuasive. She believes it was an all-purpose Neolithic temple, an important centre of the landscape, with a large oval hall that's overlooked by galleries, in which crowds of people might have gathered to hear speakers and music below. The total diameter of Stonehenge, around 30 metres, is almost exactly the same as Shakespeare's globe. Also a thatched building with incredible acoustic properties, in which the human voice can be carried to everyone in the audience. Talking to the media, Sarah said, It is, unquestionably, the right size for an enclosed public venue. Maybe there was feasting in the galleries, with dancing and musicians playing below, or perhaps ceremonies took place to welcome in the solstices. Maybe it's because I've got a vivid imagination, but I do love the sound of this idea. If she's correct, it means archaeologists have underestimated our Neolithic and Bronze Age ancestors who built Stonehenge thousands of years ago. You have to ask yourself, if they brought such colossal stones to the site, why would they stop there? Why do we assume they didn't add walls and a roof? Why would they not want protection from the elements? It's British weather after all. In terms of stone and metalwork, we know they were sophisticated people. So just because we don't see evidence of perishable materials like thatch and wood, it doesn't mean they never existed. With the freezing British climate, would you really want to welcome in the winter solstice in an open environment? Or would you want to celebrate inside, to keep warm and dry whilst enjoying festivities? She sees the large stones as being the right size to support piers for the roof and having designed landscapes for 40 years, Sarah opted to bring her ideas to life with a scale model of her vision. She used the layout of the stones to deduce what the structure might have looked like, incorporating the outer and inner circle, the horseshoe and the oval. As we know, some lintels are still slotted onto the standing sarsens, and Sarah believes that when it was complete, there would have been a complete circle of lintels. She argues the knobs and sockets would not have been necessary unless the stones were supporting something above, that something being the weight of a roof. 
According to Sarah, the remains of the doorways can also be seen in the inner circle, made up of the smaller yet still big blue stones. One of these blue stones contains a vertical groove which could have fitted a pole, perfect to support a door. More holes are seen in other blue stones, again being fixtures and fittings for doorways. Towards the centre of Stonehenge, we then come to the horseshoe of four trilithons, sets of two stones capped by a lintel, with another taller trilithon at the end. Sarah believes that these were supports for the central wooden framework that spanned the centre of the oval hall, with rafters radiating down to the outer circle of sarsen supports to support the lower slopes of the roof. In her opinion, the builders of Stonehenge would have known exactly how to build the central wooden structure as it could have resembled a large upturned boat. The final part of the puzzle was to make use of the remaining blue stones, and she even has a way to explain them. She thinks they supported columns that held up the balcony. She does add her own artistic license, such as a spiral staircase, but because woodland did cover a third of Britain in the Neolithic, it really isn't a stretch to think they would have been skilled carpenters. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love this idea, and to me it does make total sense. Sadly, Sarah hasn't been able to get any real replies or feedback from the experts, which in my opinion is a real shame. She says that anything challenging the view of a broad consensus of current archaeologists is often routinely rejected. The monument's curator, Heather Sabaya, says that one of the main points of the place is the majesty of the stones, so why would they put a roof on top? She says, the bottom line is there isn't any evidence for it. I find this view particularly odd. Part of the splendour for us in the 21st century is the majesty of the stones, of course, because they are huge and we don't know how the Neolithic people did it. But clearly they could do it, and maybe the stonework wasn't that spectacular to the Neolithic people. Maybe it was simply viewed as functional framework for an overall spectacular structure. Maybe the blue stones were not dragged all the way from Wales, but maybe they were just glacial erratic boulders found from local field clearances. Maybe archaeologists have collated the evidence, but have come up with an incorrect narrative. Furthermore, of course there is no evidence for the wooden beams and thatched roof, because such things would have decomposed in 4,000 years or so. It could have even burned down millennia ago. There's simply no way we could ever know. I for one don't think we should dismiss this idea, and I actually want to congratulate Sarah Eubank on an original and brilliant hypothesis, logical thinking that does make complete sense. Her new book, Stonehenge Temple Cipher Roof, is available now from stonehengeroof.uk, and I've linked it below in the description. I've just ordered mine, and being a beautifully illustrated book, I think many of you will enjoy it as well. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.